my name's John. I, I'm one of the pastors here at Reclaim, and, and it is a blessing to have you here with us tonight. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to dive right in. Tonight, we're in week three of our sermon series on miracles. And, and in this series, we're taking a deeper look into the, the wonders and the mysteries of the miracles of our Savior, Jesus. And as we look at a different miracle each week, we are praying for God to reveal within those miracles the lessons that we can learn from those miracles and how to apply them to our lives today. This week, we're going to look at a miracle, though, that actually occurred in the middle of a whole nother miracle. So if you guys are ready, let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, let's just get this thing started because I got a lot to cover. God was just overwhelming me this week with this story, far deeper than I've ever really looked at this story. So I'm just excited to, to share with you. Um, we're going to read from the book of Mark today, okay? So you can go ahead and turn to Mark, but we're also going to reference the book of Luke as well as the book of Matthew and I want to encourage you, the reason why we're going to look at those three books is those books are called the synoptic gospels, okay? Uh, the word synoptic comes from the Greek word synoptikos. Say that with me. Say synoptikos. There's your Greek of the week, synoptikos. Synoptikos means to be seen together. And these books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are kind of parallel gospels. They share the same stories, but in different perspectives. They're written by different authors, so they have a different viewpoint, a different vantage point. They have a different perspective because they were writing to different audiences. They were writing in different moments, and they were writing for a different purpose. And so I encourage you, when you study the Word of God, when you're studying one of the synoptic gospels, as you read the, the passages, look for the parallel passages because it adds so much depth. You know, when we talk about three-dimensional, there's three dimensional for you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, look at the dimensional aspect of those stories. So we're going to do a little bit of that tonight. But here we go, and, and actually, maybe before we jump right in, what do you say we pray and invite God into our time tonight? Let's do that. That's uh, probably a good idea. Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight. Lord, we are so excited to just be saturated in your word. And Lord, I thank you for what you're doing here. I thank you for allowing each and every one of us to be a part of the mighty move of your hand. And God, tonight we are so hungry to know you better, to understand your miracles deeper, Lord, and to understand how to apply them to our lives so most importantly, we can go out here to this world who so desperately needs your son, a savior, and that we can give you all the glory. And so, Father, we just appreciate you tonight. I pray that the Holy Spirit would be so thick in this place that it would be undeniable that your presence is right here. We love you. It's in your name we pray all God's people said. Amen. Okay, so uh, Mark chapter 5. We're going to jump into Mark chapter 5, and uh, we're going to be reading verses 21 to 34, but we're going to start with just the first few here. So we're going to start in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 24, and... Uh, Ooh, my contacts are horrible. I'm going to need like one of those big letter versions. <laughs> I'm going to have to carry this big thing here pretty soon. But uh, let's go ahead and do this. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet. And he implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live and he went with them. So let's stop right here for a second and break down what we've just read. So we know that Jesus has just come back from ministering on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, it sounds like that's a really big body of water. You hear the sea, right? Um, it wasn't that big, it, bigger than Lake Pleasant, of course, but, um, you know, he had traveled to the other side. He was doing some miracles over there. It's kind of crazy, and we may talk about it in this series, but he does a miracle over there where he casts out a big legion of demons, and they jump in a bunch of pigs, they run down the mountain, and they all die, and the, the community community actually asks Jesus to leave. They're like, hey, you know, forget about the guy you just saved. You killed a whole lot of bacon, and like, we're really angry, you know, and so they actually send Jesus off. It's the craziest thing, but Jesus is now on the boat. He's coming back over to the other side, and, and his fame now at this point his abilities, uh, his talent, obviously, what he's been doing, and his teaching has become quite a talk in the region. He's kind of created a bit of a reputation for himself. So by the time he gets to the other side, this crowd has arrived on the shore. Now, we know that in this crowd, there were a lot of high-profile people. 
There were a lot of religious leaders that were a part of this group. We know that it was a big crowd. It not only does it say great in our scripture passage, but they used the word, uh, they used that word, uh, what was it? Uh, it's this word uh, thronged. They use this word thronged. And if you don't know what that word means, that means a densely packed group of people. So this is a big group, like thousands on the seashores. They're like a mosh pit. It's like the group that shows up when Pastor Ray preaches. I'm just going to say, so it's that kind of a group, okay? Um, You know, but it's a big group. Yeah, whoop, right? You clap for Pastor Ray, right? I mean, come on. Now, on this shore was a man by the name of Jairus, and Jairus fights his way through this crowd, which is a miracle in and of itself. I mean, if you think about this, this guy was weaving and dodging and and getting through this crowd to get to Jesus when he steps off the boat. So big time miracle by itself. Now, Jairus was no ordinary guy. Jairus was kind of important. He was a Jewish religious official. This guy was in charge of the synagogue. So this guy right here would have been highly regarded. He would have been greatly respected amongst this community. I mean, this was a bigwig. This was a player, right? And he would have had wealth. He would have had power. He would have had influence. Now, Jairus was probably accustomed to, because of his position of authority, he was probably accustomed to people submitting to him all the time. But instead of expecting that kind of treatment from Jesus, we see Jairus throw himself at the feet of our Savior, right? Begging the Lord to come and lay hands on his daughter. Now, this was unexpected from a guy of this caliber. And don't forget, many of his peers were on that seashore as well. The other religious leaders and officials who quite honestly didn't really like Jesus a whole lot. They were pretty angry with this guy. This guy was stealing the show. This guy was taking authority from them. They, they were all of a sudden no longer the important people. Here comes Jesus and ultimately, obviously, they plotted for his death, but, but he didn't care. He didn't care who was watching and he doesn't use his title or his authority to demand a miracle from Jesus. He humbles himself in front of this entire group, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But let's talk about Jairus' daughter for a second here, because his behavior was a little odd. It was a little out of line, and it was out of character for a daughter. Maybe for a son. Sons were more highly regarded, more highly valued than daughters back in that time. A son was the one that carried on family lineage. Women in general were considered more property than they were people. But if we look at the parallel verse in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 8, verse 41, here's what we learn about Jairus' daughter. It was his only daughter. So this was the apple of his eye. This was his pride and joy. And she was 12, and she was dying. Now, when we read she was dying in the book of Luke, we know that this is serious. Luke was a physician. So if Luke said she was dying, we know that this was definitely a terminal condition. This wasn't just a dad being a little overreactive, okay? How many of you dads have daughters? And come on, let's be honest, right? When our daughters are sick or there's something wrong with our little girls, then we can be over the top, right? And so this wasn't Jairus. This truly was a fatal situation. Now, because of his influence and power and money, also it is most likely that he's had all the best physicians Uh, He's had all the best care, everything that could be done for her, done to no avail. We can also see how important Jairus' daughter is to him by looking at the parallel passages, by the way he called her, her his little girl, because she actually wasn't so little. She was 12. And if you remember last week when we studied, uh, you know, in our passages, at 13 to 14 years old, they married him off, and it was a girl, not a son, but this was his little girl. This was the one. So right here in this moment, as we read this passage, I just want you to understand and I want you to picture this. We see this endearing moment between not a ruler, but a father and our Savior Jesus. We see a dad crying out for his daughter's life right here. And we can learn an important lesson from Jairus. And quite honestly, it's really very countercultural. But here's what we see, is that we see that Jesus doesn't care about title or wealth or status. Those things may pull a lot of weight in today's society, but here's what we see, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Jesus only cares about our heart. Jesus only cares about our heart. Jesus saw Jairus' humility, didn't he? And he wanted to help, so he agrees to go. 
Church family, our status in the world, the number of followers we have on social media, uh, I don't know, the, the amount in our bank accounts, the kind of car we drive, the size of our offices, they don't matter in God's con- kingdom or economy. And they're not important. The thing that's important is our hearts. I remember years ago, actually, when we were kicking this church off, there was a, a gentleman that had approached me that, that attended the church, and he was very well off. And he actually said, you know what, I'd love to be a part of the church board. And he kind of insinuated that, you know what, he may even be willing to give a whole lot of money to, to find a building and to, to buy a property if he could. What was important to him was the title, the position, the stature, the authority. And you know what, it wasn't a good decision for him. It wasn't a good decision for us. It would have been wrong to put him in that kind of position just because of money. That wasn't the right decision to make. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, we don't make those kind of decisions You know, that isn't why we would do what we do. We would put him in that position because of his heart. We would put him in that position because of his spiritual leading and abilities. And so I just, I share that with you because this is exactly what Jesus looked at right here. I don't know, maybe I I should rephrase that. If you have a couple million dollars right now and you want to throw it at a building, (laughs) I may give you my office. I may name a wing after you. The kids ministry can be yours, and uh, you can be the CEO and chairman. I, you know, maybe I. No, I'm kidding. So, um, but title, wealth, and status didn't matter in God's or Jesus's economy. Let's keep going. Uh, Verses 25 and 26. Here we go. It says, "And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered much under many physicians." And had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. So now we have a new person enter the scene. We have another person who desperately needed a miracle. We have a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. Literally, she's been bleeding as long as Jairus' daughter was old. And this was a menstrual kind of bleeding. Guys, you can turn to your wives and say, is Pastor John really going to talk about periods right now? Let's just get this off the table right now. Yes, this was a menstrual bleeding. Now, they say it could have also been symptomatic of ovarian cancer, okay? Obviously, they don't get into a, a specific, you know, medical explanation, but she's been bleeding uncontrollably for 12 years. Now, I'm a guy, so I can't relate. Ladies, I'm sure your heart goes out to this woman with all kinds of compassion for what she endured. But here's the thing, this wasn't just a physical issue. This wasn't just a physical issue. In that culture at that time, blood symbolized life. So a bleeding condition symbolized life leaving the body. And any contact with blood or issues with blood was considered something that would make somebody unclean. In fact, in Jewish law, it was really severe in this area. There were specific laws and rules about handling sacrifices after they were made, about handling dead things. If something was dead, how you had to handle that, or even an open wound. This was a serious thing. The book of Leviticus even spells out the regulations or rules regarding women and their cycles. This is crazy. If you've never read it, I'll read it to you right here. Book of Leviticus, it says, It says right here in verses 25 to 27, it says, If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in uncleanliness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge shall be to her as the bed of her impurity." And everything on it which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanliness of her menstrual impurity. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and shall be unclean until the evening. So this was a big deal. And this woman had been going through this for 12 straight years. It even says in 2 Chronicles chapter 23, verse 19, that they actually had gatekeepers at the front of the temple gates that would keep anybody that was considered unclean out of the temple so she couldn't even go into the temple. So not only was this woman dealing with the physical aspect of her infirmity, but she was also deemed unclean spiritually by her society. So she couldn't live in town. She couldn't touch any of her family, even if she had one. Because remember, if an unclean person touched a clean person, they would make that person unclean. 
She couldn't be married, and if she had been married, she would have surely been divorced because that would have been grounds for divorce based on Jewish law. She couldn't really have any friends because she couldn't interact with them. She couldn't go to the market. She couldn't go to any events. She couldn't even go to the temple because of the gatekeepers to even go and worship or pray or even be prayed for. She lived in complete, total isolation for 12 years years. Then to make matters worse, it says right here in our passage that she had exhausted all of her money on doctors trying to find a cure so we know she was broke. She was probably homeless. It's not like she still had a bunch of money so she could set up a nice crib outside of town and she could chill out there, right? This woman had nothing left, literally. Now I want you to notice something different between her and the other person who needed a miracle. Are you ready for this? One is identified by name, Jairus. The other one only identified by her problem. They called her the woman with the issue of blood. In fact, in some of your Bible translations, that's how the title of this passage reads. Jesus heals the woman, you know, with the issue of blood. Now, I'm sure there was a time she had a name. Of course she had a name, right? There was a time she was called by her name, but over time she lost her name and she was consumed by her issue and that's what she became known by, the woman with the issue of blood. I ask you tonight, doesn't it stink to be, issue, or be identified by your issue? Anybody here ever been there, experienced that? He's nothing but an addict. She's nothing but a gossiper. He's grumpy. She's always depressed. He's a loser. She's a failure. Sometimes we even label ourselves, don't we? It's just who I am. It's in my genetics. It's the way I was raised. It's who I'll always be. You know, you hear that stuff long enough and you begin to internalize it, don't you? You begin to believe it, don't you? See, this woman's problem was an internal problem in more ways than one. You couldn't see where she was bleeding physically. You also couldn't see where she was bleeding mentally. She was hemorrhaging from the inside in both places. And if you didn't know her from the outside, you'd think she was okay, wouldn't you? Because you know the reality is that people only can see what you show them. So if you never knew her, You'd have never known. But she was dying on the inside, body and spirit. And church family, that can be a lonely feeling, can it? Now, I bet there's a lot of us here that can relate to this woman in some way, in some fashion, at some point in time in our lives. You know what? Maybe that time is right now. I ask you, where are you bleeding from that no one else can see? Maybe right now you're financially strapped because of the pandemic. Maybe you lost your job. So from the outside, it would appear as if it was a financial bleeding. But the bleeding's really internal because inside you're killing yourself, saying, you know what, I am worthless because I can't provide what I should be providing for for my family. Maybe right now you're single. You just can't find Mr. or Mrs. Right. From the outside, it might just seem like you're too picky, your standards are too high, but on the inside, you're beginning to think, you know what, am I not worthy of being loved? Will someone never want me for who I am? You're bleeding. Maybe tonight, you're here with your spouse, and from the outside, you look like you've got a, you're a couple that's got it all together, and you smile and you say all the right things, but the minute you leave this place and you get in the car, either there's deadly silence or the arguing ensues. And you get home and you end up in your separate rooms and you lay there at night and you wonder how much longer do I have to deal with this? Will it ever change? The woman in our story, she tried everything, didn't she? The word says she exhausted everything. She spent all of her resources looking for a cure. And I'd be willing to bet that she probably did some things that maybe helped for a few minutes. I don't know, maybe she got a hold of a, I don't know, a Young Living distributor and she got some essential oils and it helped her out for a little while. I mean, could have. 
The Bible doesn't say she never felt better. The Bible says she never got better. She never got better. And in the long run, after all the effort she put in, she tried everything. What does the word say? It just made it worse. Can anybody here relate to that? Have you ever done something in the moment just to take away the pain, just to numb the bleeding, just to maybe hopefully stop it for just a second, maybe to take you out of that situation and it only ended up making it worse? Things that, 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 that we try in desperation. But you know what? Isn't that a little bit of how sin works in our life? The enemy tempts us with that thing that provides just a moment of pleasure. He promises a cure for the bleeding, but we only find out it makes it worse. You know, I'm a stress eater. I think I've told you that a few times. And so if you see me blow up like a balloon, you know Pastor John's really stressed, right? Or if I'm changing cars on a regular basis, like if you're like, is he driving something different? Probably stressed, I'll admit it, you know? And when I get stressed, when I get stressed, you know, I go for the cookie jar, literally, right? And when the cookies are gone, I may go into the cheesecake. I'm really mad that guy, and he's lucky he's not here. He didn't make it to men's group, so there was a lot of, we bought him a birthday cake, like a half sheet of cake, and that was in there this week when I had to write my sermon. I'm like, I'm really angry with you, guy, if you're watching this right now. <laughs> but after that moment of pleasure, then the reality sinks in. I feel the guilt of the gluttony which then only magnifies the stress, which then I only seek more release, relief. Has anybody there, here ever done something like that? And I don't know what it is for you, but, but we've all struggled with that. On a serious note, maybe you're struggling in your marriage right now. And so maybe the enemy convinces you that looking at a little porn or maybe communicating with someone of the opposite sex who listens to you, who empathizes with you, who hears your problems and says you don't deserve that, that provides that little bit of release. The bleeding seems to stop. No, it doesn't. It only gets worse. It only compounds the wound with another wound. Sometimes you gotta hear this. God will let us come to a place in our lives where we realize that all the things we've been trying, they ain't working anymore. In reality, they never did. They only made things worse because you know what? There's only one thing that truly will always solve the issue. Let's keep reading to see what our woman does. Verses 27 to 29. It says, she had heard the reports about Jesus. So she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his garment. For she said, if I even touch his garments, I will be made well. And immediately, say that word, immediately, immediately, the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Tell me that's not so cool. We have another person right here who pushes through the crowd because she believed in her heart that Jesus could heal her. She believed in her heart that he could be the answer. But another little thing to note, unlike Jairus, who came walking right on up to Jesus, she sneaks in from behind. Why? Why did she do that? I mean, I think we can assume that it's because if people knew or realized who she was, there's that unclean woman, the woman with the issue of blood. If they realized who she was, then they would realize that everybody she touched pushing through the crowd would have been deemed unclean. So that probably in and of itself would have warranted a stoning and her death. But you know what? I don't really think she cared about that at that point. I really don't think she was afraid of death. I don't think she was. I think the real reason why she snuck up from behind was that for the last 12 years, she felt like nothing but a worthless human being. She felt like a dog. Someone who was so unworthy of being loved and being cared for. So she tells herself in that moment, if I could just touch his garment, if I could just touch the garment, 
Now, if you read the other translations or the other passages, if you do the parallel study, some of them say hem, some of them say tassels. Rabbis would wear these tassels that would come down. It would, it's kind of like the stripes on an officer in the military to signify who they were, to signify their authority. The hem is the bottom of the garment. So you got to understand, this is the dirtiest part of his clothes. This would have been the part that was dragging on the ground, and we know Jesus put some miles on his sandals, so this garment would have been dirty, it would have been tattered, it would have had animal feces on it, it would have had every other disgusting thing that they walked through, and she said, you know what, if I could just touch that, if I could even touch that, maybe I could be healed. And what happens? She believes, and what does she do? She walks towards the miracle. What have we talked about over the last couple of weeks? Week one, week two. Week one, the official, remember, whose son needed healing? What did Jesus say? Go, he'll be healed. And what did he do? He started walking towards the miracle. Last week, week number two, we talked about the water and the wine. What did Jesus tell the servants to do? Draw the water, walk towards the host, and serve up the miracle. As they were walking towards the miracle, it happened. And that's an important message for us tonight, and that's this. Our actions can activate our miracles. Our actions can activate our miracles. See, this woman, she didn't get healed by what she heard. She got healed by what she did. She walked to the miracle because she believed. Church family, we can hear it all the time that Jesus is the, is the answer. We can say it all the time. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer, right? We can even truly believe that to be the case. But until we start walking towards it, until we start praying, until we immerse ourselves in his word, until we follow what his word says, until we share what we believe, we will never experience the magnitude of the miracles of the workings that God can do in our lives. It is time to reach out and touch the hem of Jesus. And if you've never done that, I'll give you a chance to do that as we close up here in just a few minutes. But she touches his garment. And she's healed. But our story doesn't end quite there. Verses 30 to 32. It says, And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him, he immediately turned about the crowd and he said, Who touched my garments? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. Oops. Oops. Doesn't look like our woman's getting away with stealing a miracle from the Son of God now, does it? But I love the disciples in this moment. Like, you gotta love these guys. Jesus had literally the patience of a saint, didn't he? Like, these guys, sometimes you think about what these dudes said, but like, I can only picture this moment. They're like looking at Jesus going, bro, rabbi, like, Jesus, are you being serious right now? Like, there are thousands of people touching up against you right now. They're bumping you. They're pushing you. Like, did you not hear? Like, we are a packed house tonight, and you want to know who touched you? Do you really want us to figure this out? Like, are you really for real? But to Jesus, this touch was unique, wasn't it? This touch was different. This touch invoked a discharge of his power. This person was different than all the others that were in the crowd who were there for the show, who were there just to see what this guy was all about, to watch him perform. She was different. And Jesus needed to know specifically who this person was. Now, let's be real for a minute. We're talking about the creator of the heavens and the earth. Do we really think that Jesus didn't know who touched him? I mean, come on. Let's call it for what we know Jesus didn't know one thing. That was the day or the hour that he's coming back. Only the fathers knows. We talked about that. But come on, Jesus, he knew everything, right? He knows the number of hairs on our heads. He knew who touched him. But he didn't ask the question for him. He asked the question for her. Let's keep reading. Verse 33. But the woman, knowing what happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She was like, all right? 
Here it is. But could you imagine, just for a minute, imagine the panic she faced as she began to step forward to admit she was the one. That crowd probably got silent. Thousands of people now turning and realizing that this is the unclean woman, the woman with the issue of blood. They probably started gasping. They probably started backing up like she had leprosy. They started covering their faces. They probably started cursing her. This was probably a scene like a lynching getting ready to happen. And then the sadness and the disgrace probably set in that she felt because now she had stopped Jesus from going to that important guy's house, that Jairus guy's house, the guy whose daughter needed to be healed. And here's the bigger issue. Jesus, because she touched even the hem of his garment, would now by Jewish law be deemed unclean. And if he was unclean, then he could no longer ceremonially heal this guy's daughter. So therefore, Jairus' miracle that Jesus was on the way to go perform couldn't happen, which means now she, for her own purposes, sacrificed Jairus' daughter. So the hope of Jairus' daughter being healed was now gone. This woman was probably thinking, great, I just got healed, and now I'm probably going to die. I mean, if Jairus doesn't kill me, this crowd is probably going to kill me. And if this crowd doesn't kill me, a bolt of lightning from heaven surely probably is coming down because I tried to steal a miracle from the Son of God. But she, like Jairus, she falls at his feet and she lays it all on the line. And what does Jesus say? Verse 34 says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now, this is crazy. You read one more verse further and it says, while he was still speaking, as Jesus is talking to this woman, as we're watching this whole thing play out, it says there came from the ruler's house some who said, Jairus, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? This doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, why did Jesus call her back? Like she already knew she was healed. It says in the verse, it says she felt it the moment she touched his hem. Why does Jesus call her back? Why was Jesus wanting to find her? Why was Jesus willing to wait at the expense of Jairus' daughter dying? Spoiler alert, read one more verse. His daughter's okay. Jesus tells him to chill out. So, <laughs> here's the thing. Jesus stopped to find the woman because although she had been cured physically, she'd been cured of the physical bleeding. Inside, mentally and spiritually, she was still bleeding. And you know what? Her miracle wasn't through. Jesus wasn't done with her yet. See, if Jesus had let her sneak away in that moment, she would have gone on living the rest of her life bleeding inside mentally, bleeding inside spiritually, believing something that wasn't true. Believing that deep down inside she was still worthless. Maybe even more now because she had stole a miracle that was meant for a little girl. A little girl that ended up dying because that's all she would have heard. And then she would have thought, you know what, I really am nothing but an unclean, wretched woman maybe that doesn't bleed anymore. Jesus called her back to tell her the truth. He shares that in the very first word of verse 34 when he starts speaking to her. You may have missed this or you may just glance over it. I know I have. I've done it for years. But the very first word of verse 34, what does he say? He calls her daughter. That probably melted her. She hadn't been called by her name for heavens knows how many years. 
let alone a word that had any value to it whatsoever. And now the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, was calling her daughter. Jesus stopped everything for his forgotten daughter. And Jesus needed her to know that she had value, that she was worthy, that she was loved, and she was a daughter of God. See, it wasn't the touch that healed her. It was her faith that healed her. And by her words, as she spoke to Jesus, as she publicly proclaimed her belief and her faith, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. She publicly professed it, and he did the most amazing miracle of all. He saved her. He didn't just heal her body. He healed her soul. He stopped all the bleeding, and he sent her away with a sense of value and a sense of worth. And I can promise you, she went and she told her story to everyone she came in contact with. And she probably hugged like she never before, never did before. And I promise you, she gave him all the glory. If you're in this room tonight and you're convinced or someone's convinced you to believe that your identity is wrapped up in your situation, you need to hear this right now. God wants you to hear this right now. You're not your past. You're not your mistakes. You're not depressed. You're not anxious. Those are battles you fight, not things that define you. You're not a loser. Maybe you've just been lost. Jesus wants to heal your bleeding on the inside as well as the out because our God is still a God of miracles. And I pray tonight that if this is something you've been wrestling with, whatever it is, I pray tonight that you hear Jesus' words in this message. You are my son. You are my daughter. You are a most precious child of God. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for the hope, for being everything we need. God, I pray tonight that if there's anyone in this room needs a miracle. God, I pray tonight, and I know your word. I actually was on the front row in worship just a few minutes ago. And Lord, you told me that there's going to be some people that try to sneak out of here like that woman. And you want them to know that the sneaking's done, that you're ready to do a miracle. God, that you're calling them to be healed. And they're stopping right now and they're saying, who is it? God, I pray tonight that bondages would be broken. Tonight I pray, Lord, that there would be physical manifestations of healings. God, I pray tonight that you would overwhelm this place, Lord. Jehovah Jireh. Father, I pray tonight that if there's someone that's never made that decision to reach out, that they would say, God, tonight, I give my life to you, Jesus, in every aspect of it. I do believe and I do know that you are the Son of God. So I turn it over to you. Help me finish stronger than I started, and I'll give you all the glory and honor and praise. And we ask these things in your mighty name. And all God's people said, amen.